My name is Mark Tessier-Levine. I have the distinct privilege uh, um, of serving as the president of the Rockefeller University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. Now, I recognize many of the uh, friends of the university in the audience, and I'm delighted to see you. Welcome back. Uh, for our many first-time visitors, uh, you may be wondering, what is Rockefeller University? Uh, we are first and foremost a biomedical research institute and a graduate school for doctoral candidates. Our graduate students learn science by doing science. As a community, we share a singular commitment to advancing science for the benefit of humanity, and because of this, we are a leader in the fight against disease. We're organized around 77 uh, different laboratories, each headed by a scientist who reports directly to the president. Uh, this very non-hierarchical and uh, nimble structure enables us to be entrepreneurial and to pursue transform transformative science. Now, the university has a deep record of distinction. One impressive fact is that there have been 24 Nobel laureates affiliated with the university throughout its history. Uh, perhaps even more impressive is the fact that nearly half of our currently tenured uh, faculty members have been elected to the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. So we're, we're proud of our scientists and we're proud of the science that they do. And now tonight's program is one of several we offer throughout the year on issues that are both of keen interest to you, the audience, uh, and uh, of primary concern to our Rockefeller scientists. Our subject today is sleep, why our brains and bodies need it. We all know that sleep is important, but exactly how does sleep, or lack thereof, impact our well-being? Research suggests that normal sleep may be critical to memory function, as well as to healthy aging, and that chronic sleep disruptions may be linked to Alzheimer's disease. New research has also revealed that people who consistently fail to get re enough sleep are at increased risk of chronic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Tonight, we're fortunate uh, to hear from two investigators, both of whom are deeply engaged in the study of sleep and its impact on health. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Anna Krieger, Medical Director of the Weill Cornell Center for Sleep Medicine, and Dr. Michael Young, uh, the Richard and Jean Fisher Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Genetics here at the Rockefeller University. Mike Young's research focuses on the cellular and molecular machinery of biological clocks, the internal mechanisms that control the timing of daily activities in living organisms. His investigations of the body's circadian rhythms uh, and clocks have broad implications for the understanding of human health and disease. Anna Krieger is a physician scientist whose research explores the mechanisms of cardiovascular disease and thrombosis in sleep apnea. In addition to studying sleep disorders, she's actively engaged in patient care, education, and the training of sleep specialists. To learn more about the accomplishments of our two speakers tonight, please um, uh, refer to their biographies in the program you received on your way into the auditorium. Now, in addition to conducting their own investigations, Drs. Krieger and Young are also collaborating on a research project involving a family with a so-called delayed sleep syndrome. We'll hear more about that in just a few minutes. But now, I'd like to turn the program over to Mike Young, who, after his presentation, will turn the program over to Anna Krieger. And following their presentations, I'll moderate a brief discussion with the two of them before opening the floor to discussions. Please join me in welcoming Mike Young to the podium. Thanks, Mark. So, good evening. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, a little bit of uh, history of uh, how circadian rhythms have been studied in the past. I'm going to be talking about the genetic control of sleep and circadian rhythms, and I want to start with a, an image that is taken of a, a behavioral record of a flying squirrel. This was done uh, all the way back in 1959 when we had uh, almost no understanding of the inner workings of these biological clocks. But there are a few features of this record that I think are, are very uh, are profound. So what's going on here is you have a single animal in a cage. Uh, the animal's in, kept in constant darkness for 25 days. Each day is a line. And uh, there's a running wheel uh, in the cage. And these animals love their running wheels. When they're awake, they're almost constantly on it. And uh, there's a recorder that moves a, a pin slightly on chart paper that gives these deflections whenever the animal's on that running wheel. And what you see is that day after day, the animal gets on that running wheel with uh, incredible regularity. You can, you can predict within a couple of minutes when the animal's going to get on and when it's going to get off of that uh, running wheel for the entire 25-day 
uh, interval. Now, the other important thing to realize about this is that this is a, a reflection of an internal clock. There aren't any, there's no interference from outside uh, environmental cycles. This is not a 24 hour rhythm. If it were, uh, it would go uh, directly vertical uh, on this page. Uh, instead, about 20 minutes a day is uh, the animals getting on that uh, running wheel about 20 minutes earlier each day. So this is why we call these circadian rhythms about a day. And uh, they uh, uh, must reflect some internal mechanism uh, that, as I say, in 1959 was quite mysterious. Now, about 30 years ago, we started uh, our own running wheel experiments, but working this time with fruit flies, Rosophila. And uh, we worked with an apparatus that looks like this, and in, in fact, we have dozens of them, in which uh, uh, in each one of these tubes, we place a, a single fly. There's a little bit of food at one end of the tube uh, to keep the fly alive for a couple of weeks, a uh, cotton stopper to allow air to exchange. And there's an infrared uh, beam of light that shines across this channel so that when the animal breaks that beam, there's a signal that's sent to a computer. And in fact, we can uh, put dozens of these, uh, hook dozens of these up to a single computer and record activity. The important thing here, uh, the jump from working with a flying squirrel to working with something like fruit flies, is that we can look at tens of thousands of flies searching for mutants. Uh, animals that have a genetic variation that affects their patterns of behavior. And some example of those are shown uh, in this slide. So here's a mutant uh, that uh, has a 21 hour cycle. The usual cycle time in, in uh, Drosophila is about 23.8 hours. Uh, and down here an 18 hour cycle in mutant B. What we've got here instead of 24 hours is 48 hours in each one of these lines. So you're seeing two cycles uh, per line. Uh, a longer mutant cycle of 25 hours and still longer, 27 hours. And these are examples of the kinds of uh, heritable changes that we uh, would collect over the years. And we have still other flies that have no cycle at all. They're arrhythmic. What these uh, genes do for us is that they pinpoint positions on the chromosomes uh, that can be uh, deeply investigated to understand what the genetic con uh, contributions are to the composition of these biological clocks. And what I want to do now is to just summarize uh, decades worth of work that tell us not only how these clocks work in those fruit flies, but fortunately the genes we found are also found in us. So what I'm going to be telling you is how uh, these clocks are working in the cells of your body. So if this is the nucleus of a cell, uh, there's a continuously produced pair of proteins called clock and BMAL that I'm just going to represent C and B that are gene regulatory proteins. And they regulate gene expression by binding to two key uh, genes, one called period and another called cryptochrome or cry. And when they bind those genes, they switch those genes on so that the genes start producing information bearing molecules called messenger RNA. And each messenger RNA is the code for the production of an individual protein. It's the script. But those proteins can't be produced in the nucleus. They have to be moved to the cytoplasm where the machinery for making these proteins uh, is found. And those proteins are uh, for the per gene are turned into per pro uh, those RNAs are turned into per proteins and the RNA uh, from the cry gene is, is used to uh, construct uh, cry proteins. Now these two proteins like the C and B proteins are also gene regulators, but they have to get back into the nucleus. And this takes time because there has to be an accumulation of high levels of PER and CRY in order for them to form pairs uh, in the cytoplasm that enables them to move back into the nucleus. But once they get into the nucleus, they now act as regulators, this time not by binding directly to the period and cry cryptochrome genes, but instead by binding to the C and B proteins. Uh, stripping them off of the per and cry genes so that they can no longer keep those genes uh, turned on. The result of that is that the genes are turned off, the flow of RNA information to the cytoplasm uh, uh, falls off, the proteins in the cytoplasm are no longer made, and we have this off state uh, uh, within the cell. And this cycle can be thought of as one that switches back and forth with a 24 hour rhythm between gene off and gene on. If we if we just focus on the period and cry genes. And eventually the period and cry genes that are bound to C and B also uh, degrade, and this allows the C and B proteins to once again resume this cycle 
uh, as I've described. Now, in the next slide is an animation that shows this happening uh, in a little more, uh, in a flow chart. Uh, CNB binding to these two genes, synthesizing these RNAs that are being transported out into the cytoplasm, using that information to manufacture the period in cryptochrome uh, proteins, pairing up and moving uh, into the nucleus where they pull C and B off of the chromosomes, uh, shutting down those genes, uh, eventually leading to the loss of new per and cry uh, proteins in the cytoplasm from the nucleus and then restarting uh, the cycle. So there are many more genes involved in the composition of these clocks, but these are the only genes you need to know about for the studies that I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. Now the other uh, point I want to make is that while I'm talking about a, a small motor that drives these circadian clocks, of course what's important is what that motor does. And what that motor does is to control the expression of hundreds of genes in every cell in our bodies, in our livers, in our lungs, even in our skin cells, as you'll see uh, in a few minutes. And what this is is, a, is an image of 150 genes that are regulated with a circadian rhythm by that kind of a uh, a mechanism that I just described. So the way this experiment works is that we're, we're collecting RNA samples, messenger RNA samples, to indicate gene activity over a six-day period, which is shown down here. And uh, the first day, uh, there's light given. The second day, there's no light. Uh, the third day, again, and fourth day is a repetition. The, the fifth and sixth day is a repetition of that uh, of that scenario. And across each row is the pattern of activation and inactivation of a single gene. So that on the bottom row we have genes that are turning on at dawn, uh, indicated by red activity. Here genes that are turning on uh, with their, uh, at midnight, here at sunset, here at noon, and back to dawn. So what you should be able to see are six stripes of green and red that indicate that each of these genes is turned on six times in this experiment, which tells us something else that it's important, which is that it's not just being driven by this light-dark cycle. These genes are switching on and off, uh, both when the lights are left off and when the lights are switching uh, on and off. So this is, this is a, an, an image of what these clocks can do for us. And now what I want to do is tell you about a sleep disorder that we've been studying using this information that uh, originally was derived from our work with Drosophila. So the, the disorder is called delayed sleep phase disorder. It's, uh, as you see, among the most commonly diagnosed sleep disorders uh, in the U.S. There's a huge variation in the prevalence uh, in different reports uh, of this disorder, ranging from about two-tenths of a percent all the way up to 10 percent. And I'll uh, be talking about some reasons for that variation, uh, a little uh, possible reasons for that variation a little later on. The, uh, patients, the, the subjects that come into uh, sleep clinics complaining uh, uh, most often refer to themselves as night owls. They have a uh, uh, substantially delayed bedtime. I'll be showing you a record for an individual that falls asleep uh, every night at 4 a.m. and wakes up a little bit before noon. And there are tremendous uh, resistance. They, they find it, it's terribly difficult to change this pattern of sleep. Uh, and, of course, uh, the, uh, the conflict uh, that they uh, face is one with family, friends, and work. And so they're uh, uh, quite anxious to uh, try to understand if this can be corrected. So uh, a few years ago, we began a collaboration with Scott Campbell and Patty Murphy uh, at Cornell Weill. At a, who, they have a, a, an apartment complex in White Plains in which they can do multi-day uh, assessments of sleep and uh, physiological uh, measurements of patients that uh, have joined their studies. And we studied a number of, of individuals, about 20 individuals, and I'm just going to show you records from two of these individuals for comparison. So there, uh, when the subjects come in uh, to this study, they're, they're in an apartment by themselves. There's constant dim illumination, which comes from floor lamps and desk lamps and just to give an idea of uh, the level of illumination, it's similar to what many of you uh, came across town in, in a, an overcast, dark uh, afternoon, maybe at 5 o'clock this afternoon. And they're going to be in that condition for a little over uh, two weeks. For the first four days, they're given clocks. They know what time of day it is, and they have regular meal times. And uh, except for this constant dim illumination, 
uh, things are uh, pretty normal. In the second part of the study, in green, all the clocks are taken away and the subjects are told to sleep and eat whenever they wish. Now on day one, uh, the subjects are brought in and told to choose their habitual sleep time and sleep as they would at home. The control subject chooses 11.30 on those two nights. The DSPD subject chooses 4 a.m., as you can see here. On, night, on day two, uh, the, we have the same regime, uh, but on this, uh, on this day, we take a melatonin sample. We, we search for the time when there is a release of melatonin into the blood. Our pineal uh, in our brain uh, releases melatonin into the blood each evening, and I think Anna will probably say more about this. But we can use that as a marker of this internal clock, and for most of us, this occurs two, three, four hours before uh, the onset of sleep in our control subject. It's uh, happening at 9, a at 9 p.m., and sleep, again, occurs uh, three or so hours later. But the DSPD subject uh, has this melatonin release at three in the morning. So it's uh, tremendously delayed relative uh, to the control subject. And in addition, uh, the uh, sleep follows uh, very rapidly uh, after that onset of melatonin synthesis. On the third and fourth days, this, the, uh, the subjects are told that they have to be in bed at 11.30. They have to get out of bed at 7.30 in the morning. So they're forced in and out of bed. Uh, they still have clocks. They still have regular meal times. So that's enforced. Uh, this subject gets a little bit of sleep under those conditions. This one does a little bit better, but both manage to do that. And as I said, at the point of the asterisk and for, uh, from there uh, on in this study, the clocks are taken away, and now the subjects are free to sleep as they wish. So the control subject sleeps at about the same time each evening. There's a, a little bit of a drift to the right, indicating that the subject's natural rhythm is a little longer than 24 hours. And studies done years ago at Harvard indicate that for most of us, uh, our internal clocks that regulate sleep run at about 24 hours and 12 minutes, plus or minus two or three minutes. So we're not very different from the flying squirrels with regard to precision. <laughs> Uh, the DSPD subject is very different. As you see, they rapidly run out, getting later and later each day. There's this period of, of uh, 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 disruption, uh, but then a continuation into this very late and later sleeping day after day, so that by the 13th day, this, this uh, DSPD subject is starting to sleep at about one in the afternoon in the outside world. So it's a, a, a huge difference between the control and the DSPD subject. Now down here we're following the body temperature rhythm of these subjects through the same uh, uh, two-week period. And uh, uh, the control subject, uh, first I should just point out that your body temperature cycles. Uh, most of us uh, may not appreciate that, but a couple of degrees each day, our lowest body temperature is shortly before we wake up, and it increases uh, uh, to its high point in the uh, evening. And the control subject has a, a robust 24.3 hour uh, body temperature rhythm. The height of this peak indicates how regular those cycles of body temperature are. So every day they're coming up with something very close to 24.3 hours. In contrast, the DSPD subject has a half an hour longer body temperature and it's a very low amplitude temperature, meaning that the, the cycle time is very undependable. It expands and contracts from, from day to day. And of course, it, uh, it, you might think that this is a pretty good reflection in the sleep pattern of what we are also seeing in that body temperature uh, assessment. Now, what uh, at this point, uh, Alina Potke, a uh, postdoc uh, in our lab, received uh, skin biopsies from each of the subjects that were in this study. And she was amazed to find that the DSPD subject, uh, tau 11, that I just showed you records for, not only has behavior that is slow running, that the skin cells, individual skin cells, had slow running molecular clocks. And these clocks run about a half an hour slower than uh, control clocks, control subjects clocks in these skin samples. And that for us uh, was our first indication that this was likely to be a hardwired and perhaps genetic variation that was responsible for this uh, behavior. And uh, indeed, what uh, Alina next did, we have this list of genes that we know compose uh, these circadian clocks uh, in everything from uh, fruit flies to humans. She went down that list and sequenced 
uh, all the genes that were a part of that uh, clock gene list and found a variation in the gene cry, which you now know how it participates in these cycles. Now, for those of you that want the full story, what has happened here is that there's a nucleotide substitution uh, immediately downstream affecting a splice donor site for uh, exon 11, which means that exon 11 is going to be skipped in the production of messenger RNA. For most of us, what's important is that this, uh, this individual is making cryptochrome RNA from one of its genes that is too short. It's got an internal deletion. It's as if you have a page of script about uh, instructions for building a protein and you've removed a paragraph from the middle. So you make a shorter messenger RNA, which can be seen here for subject 11 uniquely compared to all these other subjects, and a shorter protein coming from that shorter RNA, two forms of the protein in that individual. We were lucky that the, uh, there was a lot of interest in this study coming from other members of the subject's family, and the reason is because several of them also, uh, uh, we found out, have DSPD. And so uh, the, the uh, labeling that we're using here, a capital A means they have the usual form of cryptochrome. A uh, capital C means they have the variant form of CRY, which I'll also refer to as CRY11 later on. So all of these individuals in black that have AC uh, carry the variant form and the, and the usual form. This cousin carries only the usual form. All of those uh, in black have uh, delayed sleep phase disorder by virtue of questionnaire. And of course, we uh, uh, determine the DNA sequence to understand the genotype. Uh, and uh, the numbers that are shown be beneath each of these individuals, females in circles and males uh, in squares, those are the midpoints of sleep for each of those individuals. So uh, this is the original subject, and she's just halfway through sleep at a quarter of eight. Uh, but uh, her, her siblings and her niece uh, don't vary very much from that uh, already delayed uh, sleep pattern. Uh, the cousin that has uh, uh, two usual forms of cryptochrome uh, is not uh, delayed with regard to the midpoint of sleep. But this was the puzzle for us. Uh, this individual has the variant gene, but reported a midpoint of sleep of 2.45 in the morning. Uh, when we interviewed this subject, we found out that she's holding down a job that starts early in the morning, and the only way she can show up uh, uh, for work uh, in a dependable fashion is to set her alarm clock every day of the week, Sundays, weekends, holidays, uh, for 4 a.m. So this is a self-driven uh, uh, self uh, uh, midpoint of sleep. Uh, and uh, she, like the other members of the uh, family with uh, both copies of this gene, uh, has a history of disturbed sleep. How does this, uh, how does this altered gene uh, provide a slow-running clock? So again, this is work that Alina did using cultured cells, cultured cells of two types, cultured human cells and cultured mouse cells. And what Alina found was that uh, when C and B, of course, bind to PER, there are two forms, two uh, copies of the PER gene. They're both identical, so we just represent one here. Uh, and things happen as, as they should. Uh, PER is, uh, produces messenger RNA when switched on. When C and B bind, they bind to two forms of the CRY gene, the CRY, the usual form, the CRY, uh, indicated as CRY, and the variant form, CRY11. So we have two forms of CRY, CRY and CRY11. One form of PER, we form two kinds of PER-CRY pairs. Both of those move as they should to nuclei, but once in nuclei, there's a change in the way in the behavior of these two forms of pairs. It's the CRY11 PER pair that almost always interacts with the C and B proteins and pulls them off uh, the DNA to shut down these genes. And the CRY11 form of the protein is a much more powerful inhibitor of C and B. And so it holds C and B off of those genes for a longer duration during each cycle, stretching out the cycle, producing a slow running clock. Now we've been studying this in just one family, but we were very interested in whether or not this variant form of cry exists elsewhere in the human population and how frequent is it. And this is a, uh, a database that is uh, uh, kept in uh, Cambridge in which many different investigators that are collecting tens of thousands of DNA samples pool their data 
uh, for study. And uh, this is an addressable database that any of us uh, can search for uh, variants that we wish to know something about. So each of us has two cry genes. Uh, and, uh, and this study has sequenced 121,000 cry genes, uh, which must come, if, if everybody has two, which must come from about 60,000 uh, subjects. And in those 60,000 subjects, 526 instances of this variant gene have shown up. Now the frequency of that variant, variant gene, though, can be very different in different populations. For example, in this East Asian uh, population, which is small, about uh, four or 5,000 individuals, there are no copies uh, of this gene found. But if we look up here at the largest group of individuals, about 30,000 individuals, there are 436 copies of this variant gene in that population, which means that uh, European population or, uh, or uh, uh, those of European uh, extraction, uh, about one in every 150 of those individuals carries this variant gene in the same way that members of this uh, family we've been studying uh, carry it in, a, in usually a heterozygous uh, condition. Although, as you see, six uh, of these individuals actually carry two copies of this gene. So we'd, we'd love to know more about these individuals. Uh, but for the time being, what this tells us uh, is that this variant could make a very uh, significant impact on the frequency of DSPD in this European population. So let me summarize what I've uh, uh, told you. Uh, the CRY11 variant shows excessive binding to the circadian activator uh, proteins in both mouse and human cells. CRY11 appears to be a strengthened inhibitor. The stronger binding of CRY11 versus the usual form of CRY uh, suggests a basis for its inheritance as a dominant uh, gene. That is, it hardly matters that these patients, these subjects have uh, the more common uh, form of uh, cryptochrome if this variant form pushes it out of the way and, and gets to uh, interact with uh, uh, the genes almost all the time. CRY11 production is sufficient to slow circadian rhythms of mouse and human skin cells. I didn't tell you about these experiments, but Alina has moved the, the variant gene into control subjects' skin cells and into mouse, uh, uh, normal mouse skin cells and has slowed the clocks by doing that uh, in each case. So this gene is sufficient to slow down these circadian clocks. And finally, since the CRY11 gene was inherited in the family study, we expect that every tissue uh, in these individuals will have a slow running clock. And we've only assessed uh, the sleep pattern, but we're quite interested in what other issues uh, that are dependent on uh, clock function might be affected uh, in other tissues. And finally, some uh, conclusions. Uh, we can study complex behaviors uh, such as sleep in a simple model organism. Uh, lessons learned about genetic control of these behaviors can apply to more complex organisms, in including humans. And in the current instance, an understanding of the inner working of circadian clocks obtained from uh, studies in fruit flies has allowed us to explore the basis of a common human sleep disorder. Now, let me close by showing you a picture of Alina, who's done all that molecular biology. Uh, she's a former Women in Science postdoctoral fellow. She's uh, a research associate uh, in the laboratory. I'm fortunate she's in California, uh, couldn't be here tonight. Uh, our collaborators uh, in White Plains were Scott Campbell and uh, Patricia Murphy. And Anna Krieger, who's our next uh, speaker, was also a collaborator in this study, made it possible for us to take reams of data from those sleep apartment uh, complexes, sleep and physiological uh, assays, and make sense of them. So thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Pastor Levine, for the invitation, the Women in Science uh, Committee as well. And it's a hard act to follow now Mike Young's presentation. So we're going to try to dig in into a more clinical aspect of sleep and try to make sense of a little bit of the changes uh, that Dr. Young was talking about in the advanced phase or the late sleep phase, for instance. So sleep is generally a new field in medicine. And what we're going to talk about today relates to the fact that the historical perspective, sleep was taken as really a passive state, generally speaking. And here we can see even depicted by this picture of the two, the twin brothers, one showing that and the other one showing sleep and how similar they uh, relate to each other. 
Now, what was interesting is that it wasn't until 1929 that we started to understand that the sleep is actually a very active state. So with the development of EEG in Austria, and now, of course, it's spread into the entire world, we're able to detect that it's actually electrical activity in the brain that is generated during the day and, of course, during the night as well. So that re revolutionized the idea of sleep and also was the beginning of the development of what sleep medicine is as a specialty as well. Here we can see the brain wave activity, which then can be recorded at night. We put electrodes in the head and if any of you have seen anybody undergoing a sleep study, similar to the EKG electrodes that we have in the chest, there are, EKG, there are electrodes that are placed on the skull and they're able to monitor activity. Now it's very interesting to see because the activity during wakefulness, if you were to now close your eyes, tends to be a very rapid, shallow uh, electrical movement. Now, as people transitioning to sleep, this becomes a little more slower, and the higher amplitude waves come through, and those are characteristics of what we call a slow wave sleep, stage three of sleep, stage four was an old nomenclature, nowadays we focus on calling this just stage three. So this stage of sleep is actually very important because when we are very young, we have a lot more of the stage three. Now, a lot of the behaviors that happen, kids that sleep talk, sleep walk, sometimes even through adulthood, they tend to be generated during this type of sleep. It's really, again, the high amplitude. Now, what is fascinating to see is that not just the concept that sleep is really an active state, we also see that sleep within itself is really phasic. We go from stages of very superficial sleep into deep stages of sleep in a cyclical manner. So every hour or hour and a half, we go through a whole cycle of sleep, and at the end of the period, we get into rapid eye movement, which is now a stage of sleep where a lot of fast activity is happening in, in order for, to protect us from acting out this activation that is happening in the brain, the body feels paralyzed. So except for the diaphragm and the eye movements, all the other muscles really have very low muscle tone. So that can as well lead to some other disturbances during the sleep. So it's very important for us to try to understand the physiology of sleep in a patient with sleep disorders. Now in a normal individual, we'll see those cycles lasting about an hour and a half, and you go through about four or five cycles as the night goes on with more and more rapid eye movement in less and less slow wave sleep. Now what is fascinating is to see that this cycle of sleep, if we were to see on this diagram coming here on this first night, over a period of three nights we get to see that this is part of a whole circadian rhythm that the body has. So not as here is what we just saw with the changes in sleep, and this is part of a body temperature cycle changes, as Dr. Young mentioned, the body temperature reaches its nadir halfway during the night, and then it reaches a higher point during the day. If we look at our ability to perform cognitively speaking, even if we were to maintain wakefulness, we perform a lot better, we make less mistakes during the day, more mistakes during the night. Hormones are also regulated by the circadian rhythm. We can see the melatonin secretion happens at night and is totally suppressed during the daytime. And again, the peak is synchronized with the body temperature, and that's what determines the phase of sleep, as Dr. Young was mentioning. We can also see the other hormones change. For instance, we see cortisol tends to be suppressed during the night and then peaked shortly after awakening in the morning. And we can also see growth hormone, just to show you another example, that it tends to peak in the first third of the night, closely associated with that slow wave sleep stages that we saw earlier on. And that's why in an old tale we used to still say sometimes that if kids don't go to bed early, they miss out on the growth hormone and they may not grow. And that's just the idea that perhaps the growth hormone secretion will be impaired if you miss out on the slow wave sleep that should come early in the night. What is fascinating about this is that it's just not the human cycle that happens like that. We can see in nature there are lots of examples of the circadian rhythmicity that happens in other animals, as Dr. Young said, and also in plants. So we can see in an old experiment over 300 years ago, we could see that there were plants that would just shut down and close their leaves during the nighttime. And the scientists decided to put the plants inside a closed cabinet to see if this was just a direct effect of the light or if that was an intrinsic effect. So this was a very smart, very simple experiment that shows that this cycle was independent of the light exposure. So it's something that 
identifies it as intrinsic process is happening at a cellular level. And in the body, in the human body, we also understand that it regulates other processes. So it's not just happening just because, it's happening because it's synchronizing the entire physiology of your system. And there are specific pacemaker cells, we call, that sit in the brain about 10 to 20,000, closely to 20,000 neurons that are specifically targeting and their idea is just to maintain the cycle of sleep and maintaining the oscillation and this is just connected to other areas of the brain including the timing for release of melatonin because melatonin is the dark signaling hormone and also again is responsible for connecting to the peripheral oscillators which are cells in the body that maintain the rhythm of the 24-hour cycle. What is fascinating to see is this horm these neurons now, they sit very closely just above of the optic chiasm, which is the sensitivity of the neurons that travel from the eyes, from the retina, all the way into the brain. So what happens is that the signal that we're talking about here uh, is connected to the outside world through the eyes. So the light exposure will travel and send the message through the suprachiasmatic nuclei in here and regulate the entire process of the circadian rhythm. And at the same time, regulate the secretion of melatonin and the signal to sleep, which will travel to the entire cortex. And that's when people perceive that they are asleep and quiet during the night period. In a simple diagram, what we see is if we were to put together this circadian rhythm, we get to see that most people have a surge in the sleepiness, which is again chemically driven, that happens during the night time. And then during the daytime, we have a better, better performance because the sleep signal is now shut off. Now, some people have a, sec a burst of sleepiness that happens in the afternoon, and this is over a two-day period, and that in some cultures is considered a siesta time. It can be culturally accepted as well. Uh, but most of us learn how to suppress that signal because it's really a much milder signal in comparison to the night rhythm. Now, what is interesting to see is that some people have a misalignment of the signal, as Dr. Young was mentioning. Sometimes people may have what we call an advanced signal, so they have a signal to go to bed early and to wake up early. And other times, they have a delayed signal that we see in red, which is similar to the subjects we're talking about. So what happens to them, their own signal for sleep doesn't come until much later. So they feel the need to sleep at a different clock time than most people. And that can lead to a lot of social and work-related issues. Now, one of the aspects that we look at in order to help coordinate this is by knowing that light has a big effect in regularizing the circadian rhythm. So if we have a light stimulus that comes in the evening on people that have this early rhythm, we might be able to push it off a little bit. And at the same time, if we have a light stimulus that comes in in the morning, we could be able to synchronize the schedule of a person with a delayed rhythm or to force into an earlier time. Now what we don't like to see is when we have a lot of light exposure late at night on people that have normal schedules. Because what happens is that it may cut down the signal to sleep, but at the same time people will not be allowed to sleep in the next day because commitments and a schedule would get you up early. So we have to be very careful about environmental exposures to light as well. Now the reason for that is because again cognitive function is limited by what we happens with your cycle of sleep. So basically, here's just an example of someone that just stayed up for several hours. So this is 12 noon, 6 p.m., midnight, no sleep, and then on to the next day. And if we monitor very simple tasks, looking at digit substitution tasks, we can see that more mistakes are made during the night time, the period that we're supposed to be asleep, even if they are still awake with a recovery happening in the morning. Now the same thing we see with this PVT test, which is a very simple test, it's a reaction time. You see a signal on the screen, on a laptop, let's say, and you need to have a finger response, so you need to tap a key of the computer. And that reaction time is now documented. And we can see that more mistakes are made during the nighttime period with an improvement during the daytime. And this is again synchronized to changes in our body temperature. So we can see how the signal for the circadian rhythm is important in our cognitive function.
When we see the jet lag situation, we see that that happens quite drastically. So if we travel across many time zones, what happens in, as showing on this diagram, we can see here someone being in London, the urge to sleep matches their usual night period. But if you travel east to Hong Kong, the time is no longer allocated for sleep on the proper biological signal. And the same thing happened if you travel west, there's a dyssynchrony with the schedule. The body doesn't feel right because the circadian rhythm is not coming on the appropriate time. In many situations, people feel fatigue, physical and mental fatigue, irritability, headaches, of course, sleep is now fragmented, decreased appetite, and gastrointestinal problems as, as well are noted. One of the treatments that we frequently talk about how to improve jet lag more rapidly is exposure to light, and also sometimes even the use of melatonin, it can increase the signal for sleep on the current time zone when you're traveling across at least three time zones. Other causes of sleep loss that we get to see now commonly are sometimes self-inflicted. Uh, schedule, worries, many people worry. Some people worry about their own sleep and that keeps them from sleeping well at night. We also have leisure activities and work schedule again, uh, intruding during the night. In use of electronic devices, we have been seeing this a lot more lately. And there's one big concern. So remembering what we're talking about, the circadian rhythm, the light exposure, darkness, melatonin. So look at this gentleman laying on the bed at night on a darkened environment with his own private source of sunlight, almost. So you can't imagine what could happen with his, his own circadian rhythm. So we have to be very careful because a lot of the electronic devices, they emit light that focuses on this blue wavelength spectrum of light. And this is really the part of the, the wavelength of light where our circadian system is the most sensitive to. So we have to be very careful on when we expose ourselves to those devices predominantly on the night time. One interesting experiment that we did with high school students was to look what would be the effect of the daylight savings time when we lose an hour. We just gained an hour last week and so we're all very happy about that. Now the downside is that we will lose it again early next March. And it comes very early in the year where the days are still very short. So we decided to follow up 40 students. We monitored them at baseline the week before the daylight savings time change. And then we monitored them over the weekend of the change and the week after. And what we got to see on that same simple PVT test, so they were given this computerized test for a reaction time. The week before, they did pretty well, not as a little more rapidly on Wednesdays, but otherwise very stable. And now we can see at least a 10% reduction on the speed of response throughout the week after daylight savings time. So these students were sleeping an average 30 minutes less every night of the week. So now they carry a cumulative sleep loss. And that has huge implications because we live in a society where we went from 50 years ago from sleeping about eight and a half hours as adults in society to sleeping close to seven hours. The good thing is that this trend is really not getting worse. It seems to have stabilized about 6.9, 6.8 hours. And of course, the inception of home and office computers and handheld devices didn't help because we can see a little, you know, by coincidence perhaps, but two infliction points in there. And we can also see a major increase in obesity, which is a whole other discussion. What is the potential effect? So this is just showing two graphs and perhaps the potential association, but it's a mechanism that needs to be thoroughly investigated if we're losing sleep and then changing our meta metabolism because it changes in the the pattern of how the body functions at night. And we live in a sleep deprived society as we saw before, but people that sleep less than six hours a night may be at higher risk for developing chronic disease. So those are the people we tend to focus a little more on. And there are about 70 million adults that fit this criteria nowadays. There are cognitive effects that we see when we compare behaviors from people that sleep eight hours a night for people that sleep less. At the University of Pennsylvania, they did a very interesting study where they had college students staying over for two weeks. And again, most of those studies with two weeks tend to be college students during that summer break. They get paid, they go into the laboratory and spend two weeks being tested. So the groups were divided into four. 
We have one group in here, eight hours, so they are allowed to spend eight hours in the bedroom and then they were woken up. The group in green was still, they could only spend six hours in the bedroom. The group in yellow, four hours. And the people in red here only stayed on for two nights, but they could not go to sleep. So what we got to see here on the same PVT test, again, a very simple test of reaction time. What we can see is that the group that slept for four hours, after about a week, they were performing at the same level as the people that didn't sleep the night before. Now, this same effect carried over for the six-hour sleepers after two weeks. So their performance was really diminished. And of course, the people that kept on sleeping four hours for two weeks ended up with the same performance as the group that missed two hours, two days or two nights of sleep. The other imp important effect is that it relates to the detrimental cognitive changes that we see when people are intoxicated with alcohol. So we can see that lack of sleep, in this case missing one night of sleep, gets people to behave very similar to people that are intoxicated. And that also functional MRI studies showing that the activation pattern when you're subjected to tests, mathematical tests, when you're well rested, is much different from when the brain is sleep deprived. So this is subjects that missed one night of sleep and we can see that the brain is really not responding in not all areas of the brain are being activated as they should. So the question that we always get is what is the ideal duration for a sleep? So it has of course an individual variation but we know the recommended amount based on the latest recommendation by the National Sleep Foundation is for adults between seven and nine hours. However, some people may lay closer to six or closer to ten. Uh, older adults perhaps one hour less, so between seven and eight hours in average but a range between five and nine hours. However, we estimate that again very few people can effectively find function with less than six hours. And we need to always monitor their genetic basis based on proteins and genes that may determine not only the timing of sleep, but as, at the same time the duration of sleep that people may need. Many functions of sleep that are important, and that's the reason why we're talking about this today. Restoration, rejuvenation, enhances learning, memory skills. We know memory uh, is really affected in, by lack of sleep, problem solving, reaction time as we spoke. Mood regulation and immune function is also affected by sleep. The individual effects of inadequate sleep we mentioned, neurocognitive hormonal changes, increased risk for obesity, all the chronic disease that we're seeing. But collective through public health concerns, we also have a lot of people getting into accidents because they are driven, they are driving, and we see a lot of drowsy driving probably accounting for 10 to 15 percent of the motor vehicle accidents. Perhaps a little more because when people fall asleep at the wheel, they don't remember. So sometimes they are not able to tell exactly what happened and those may not be accounted for. And I got a lot of work productivity laws associated with this as well. So we'll wrap up talking about some key elements of sleep. So looking into a positive side, how do we implement good sleep? Uh, we spoke about timing sleep, we spoke about duration, we need to make sure that there is good quality as well. So there are some sleep disorders that are very prevalent in the population, so we're going to be very briefly mentioning this. Insomnia, we can see based on surveys by the National Sleep Foundation that a lot of people have here was a survey looking at 42% of the adult population in the U.S. mentioning that almost every night they have sleep problems. So this is highly prevalent. We also see sleep apnea affecting probably 25 million adults in this country. So that's another very urgent crisis that we need to address in order to get people to benefit from sleep. Sleep apnea just mechanistically affects the airway, so we can see that there is a narrowing at a portion of the posterior space of the throat. Sometimes it's associated with obesity but not on everybody. So there are different phenotypes of patients with sleep apnea. Sometimes we have patients that are very thin and athletic, and they may still have problems maintaining the airway patency during the night. And our major concern about this is because if we follow people that are untreated, they have severe sleep apnea over a period of 15 or longer years, we can see that their chances of surviving are much lower than the general population or people that have milder sleep apnea. Another interesting disorder that may happen during the night, we're showing in here on those videos, are just movements in the body, sometimes in the arms or legs, that may not be noticeable to the individual, 
but perhaps a bad partner could describe this. And you can see somebody it's very lightly in here, but this is disturbing the sleep quality as well. So it creates a lot of sleep fragmentation, and that causes sleep distur disturbances during the day as well, and people feel tired. Another important aspect, and now is more physiologically important, is that sleep changes as we get older. Different life cycles for women, and as we get older, more fragmentation. People tend to have a more tendency to nap. And of course, there are higher rates of sleep disorders, as many other disorders, as we get older. Medications are very important for any other underlying conditions. It's always important to discuss with doctors what is the potential effect of this medication on my sleep. Um, food, alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, chocolate are really not good for the evening at least. Uh, they tend to impair our ability to sleep well and cause a lot of fragmentation of sleep. A lot of the foods that are considered good for breakfast are actually very good for the evening because they are <laughs> rich in serotonin and they lead to more uh, melatonin secretion, oatmeal, cherries, banana, and milk. Um, often I get asked the question why people eat this and don't feel sleepy in the morning. It's because we have our circadian rhythm and a lot of alertness kicks in in the morning, so that's why uh, we don't feel sleepy after eating that during the day. So what can you realistically do with your sleep? So given all the aspects we spoke about, we need to focus on optimizing our sleep timing. So keep in mind what is the best circadian rhythm for us to follow as an individual, what fits us well. Uh, keep the schedule very regular and avoid the changes that happen on weekends. Of course, with travels, days off, sometimes you can't fully control your schedule, but to the best of our ability, we should be able to keep that very regular. Some people choose to track their sleep with devices and there are many devices available. Sometimes I tell people to follow a quick sleep diary and this is something I do even on an Excel spreadsheet. We just follow the times here from 6 p.m. until 5 p.m. the next day for instance. And this is the block of sleep from 10.30 until about 6, 6.15 in the morning. What we don't like to see is when people have this type of patterns because they may sh come in saying I have insomnia but what we get to see is that people sleep very little during the weekdays and then when the weekends come not only they catch on sleep, but they go to bed very late. So this may be actually someone that has a delayed sleep pattern that is intrinsic, but during the week is forced into keeping a regular schedule. So this can be very telling. Also optimizing sleep duration. It's important for us to avoid the stimulating activities at night, at least within the last 30 to 60 minutes prior to sleep. If we need to use electronic devices, there are actually software that can be used in the computer, or even lenses, those amber glasses that can be used, and they can cut down the blue wavelength to stimulus to the brain. We also need to be mindful that increasing our body temperature through exercise or perhaps a too hot of a shower before going to sleep may not be ideal. And again, worries and stressors at night really tend to impair our ability to relax and sleep well. And work on quality of sleep. If there are concerns about sleep apnea, there are easy screening procedures. CPAP equipment is really not uh, that cumbersome. It's still, of course, an issue. And there are dental appliances that can be used as well for treatment of sleep apnea. And if restless legs or leg movements, as we showed, may be present, we need to get some blood work evaluation discussed with doctors as well. So overall, the strategies to improve sleep will be focusing on putting those three pieces together, the timing, duration, and quality of sleep. We need to always look into a personalized approach, and this is one of the things in sleep medicine that fascinates me the most, because we need to treat with individuals and know how to put together a regimen that will help them to sleep better. And follow, again, the circadian cycle and increase light activity and exercise. And the bedroom is very important. We need to create an environment for sleep that is conductive of sleep. So this is just one example, quiet, decluttered bedroom. And what I always ask people is really to avoid what we call the ultimate home office, which is a bedroom like that. So with that note, I thank you so much for your time. So thank you very much, uh, Anna and Mike, for these uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, now I'll start the questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, maybe I'll start with a, a couple of questions uh, for Mike. Um, 24 hours and 12 minutes, you told us, uh, is the, the rhythm that most of us have here, not the, 
the one in 150 people, probably two of them in our audience here, two or three who have that cryptochrome 11 mutation, right? So they're in the, the three to 450 people here, there are probably a few cases, but um, the, the, uh, uh, the average person, 24 hours and 12 minutes, give or take a few minutes, why not exactly 24 hours? Why is our rhythm slightly off the 24 hour cycle? So this is, this is something that is species specific. Uh, uh, so uh, if, you, if, 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 I, if I brought out a series of experimental organisms, we'd have as many different uh, natural circadian rhythms uh, as we have organisms. They range, uh, some, some uh, organisms have natural rhythms of 22 hours, uh, others uh, up to about 25. When we make mutants, we are able to generate uh, flies with 35-hour rhythms. It's very easy to generate a mutation that will give us a very different rhythm. So uh, uh, another thing to appreciate is that the rotation of the Earth has changed over the past uh, 4 billion years. We used to be on a much more rapidly uh, rotating uh, Earth. And certainly one of the pressures that have been on all of these organism is, organisms in order to adapt to a changing periodicity of that rotation is to change their circadian rhythm. So it's very likely, for example, that the cyanobacteria that built the stromatolites uh, two and a half million, uh, billion years ago uh, had clocks that were running uh, significantly faster than those of the extant cyanobacteria today. So, uh, the other piece of this is that because we usually don't have to depend on our internal clocks uh, to tell us uh, when 24 hours has occurred, we've got temperature cycles and light cycles, and we have very strong resetting uh, mechanisms. Uh, most of us, uh, if we're only uh, 12 minutes off per day, it's fairly easy uh, to pick that back up. And so for whatever reason, it hasn't been uh, essential to have exactly 24-hour rhythmicity, probably because uh, we've evolved in an environment that is robustly rhythmic. And while we, it helps us anticipate things, it allows things to happen in the middle of the night uh, when there you know, aren't changes in light and dark. Things that happen at 4 a.m. versus 12 midnight versus uh, 11 p.m. Those are important things that have to be ordered but the precise periodicity, we, we have some flexibility with because we have these robust environmental cycles that we live in. So your answer is, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Okay, <laughs> good. Just, just want to make Sorry. sure. Just want Sorry. to make sure I got it. Uh, so, and, and so how does entrainment work? Okay. So, so the light turns on, so we now are at 24 hours rather than 24 hours and 12 minutes. Right. So in Drosophila, there is uh, cryptochrome uh, is sensitive to light. And uh, uh, blue light of the type that uh, we see in, in a lot of sunlight and that Anne was talking about causes cryptochrome to degrade very rapidly. So as soon as the lights come on, cryptochrome degrades. And so now you don't no longer have uh, a clock that's functioning until the lights go back off. And so you have, in the presence of a light-dark cycle, you have a push and hold mechanism that's enforced by that light-dark cycle. It comes back to the last question a bit. Uh, in humans, we have a special, uh, a special opsin called melanopsin that is in our retinal ganglion cells in the backs of our eyes that uh, absorb uh, light in the blue wavelength and also are dedicated to resetting our uh, biological clocks. So it, it, there's some variation in the way the light response is achieved in humans versus uh, Drosophila, but in both cases we have these, these uh, very sensitive light responsive mechanisms that will drive the uh, circadian clock uh, directly to zero when the, the lights uh, come on. These individuals with DSPD uh, who want to go to bed at 4 a.m. What's light life like for them? Does this, uh, do they feel energized by this? Do they feel depressed by this? Does it, is it of no consequence whatsoever to them? What is the experience of individuals who have this kind of, of disorder? Maybe you or, or Anna could, could tell us about this. Do you want to? 
so what is fascinating is that if they are able to sustain the daily activity level in the schedule during the day that allows them to maintain the biological rhythm of being at the SPS, they can do fine and they may be asymptomatic. The major problem comes that this is you know, a problem in society. If you're growing up, you need to be in school at a certain time, you need to show up for work early. So they suffer and they become very sleep deprived. And oftentimes, not everyone is so di diligent as the person you had that would always do the alarm clock at 4 a.m. because she, needed, she knew how important it was to maintain the schedule. Often Oftentimes they suffer because on the weekends or days off, they allow the body to run with a free rhythm, and that can become a major problem. So they can become severely sleep deprived. So speaking of, of some individuals who tend to go to bed, like teenagers. So uh, is it the case that teenagers change their circadian rhythms? It certainly seems to be the case, at least the ones I've experienced in my household. Uh, and uh, is that a, a common feature among teenagers? And what are the implications? Yeah, so it tends to be in a lot of teenagers a transitional phase that they would need to, the sleep phase would be shifting to a later time. And perhaps Mike can tell us a little bit about the chemical process behind this. But most of them tend to transition back as they get older. So it is a bit of a crisis that happens because it comes at a period in their lives where they have a longer sleep need still, so they wouldn't be sleeping as long as adults would. They still would need an extra hour or two. And now their signal for sleep is coming late. And on top of that, they are exposed to an environment that is full of lights and excitement. So that is even now adding this extra stimulus with light exposure and social activities that further postpone bedtime. So there is a a bit of a challenge in the household, not just as physicians and providers when we deal with those cases, that needs to be maintained. A lot of education in a lot of discipline is really the only way to try to offset that. It doesn't happen with every teenager, uh, but I think when it happens, you really need to tackle on from the beginning. And I can tell you from my household, my son has some of those amber glasses on his nightstand. So if he has late homework, he knows to put this on anytime after 9.30. So we try to create an environment. And he understands the effect of not sleeping well. Uh, but it's always a battle. It's always a battle, so it's not easy. The good aspect is, again, is transient. Sometimes when they move, follow on into college, let's say, those kids that are really truly delayed, they start choosing sometimes afternoon classes, and they may postpone the correction and the entrainment of this rhythm, uh, which then becomes a problem when they finish college and they hit the work, phase, the work environment. Um, so I think in any event, it's something that they need a lot of education on and try to figure out how to learn coping skills in order to entrain the rhythm. You know, the, uh, I mean, there's, there's been a, a term for this phenomenon now, uh, social jet lag, which is, and I, I think you showed some slides of this, where, uh, and this really arises in teenagers and, and college students, where they'll have one pattern of sleep during the week, and then the weekend, it's a free-for-all. And uh, studies have, have, have looked at, uh, uh, investigators have looked at some of these things very carefully, and have concluded that this is very much like getting on a jet and, you know, covering a couple of time zones and then after a couple of days coming back again. And what we've learned from uh, studies in mice in particular about what uh, happens to you when you make those kinds of changes, if we, if we had, a, if we had a, a simulation in which we took a mouse from New York to Tokyo and we look at what's happening over the week that it takes for that mouse to adjust, uh, to that new time zone. We find that it's not some nice uh, march of the whole organism, uh, all the clocks in that organism to that new time zone. In fact, what's happening is that the, the SCN, that part of your brain that is most likely to control wake sleep cycles, tends to shift very quickly. But your liver takes six or seven days. Uh, your skeletal muscles take five or six days. What jet lag really is, is a state of desynchrony more than anything else. Rather than being in the wrong time zone and in some, you know, marching across a series of time zones, you're just scattered all over the ocean uh, for several days until you finally, these systems finally uh, coalesce uh, with a correct phase that, that fits the schedule at the uh, landed in location. So social jet lag, you're, you're going back and forth through this uh, every week. And is the old rule of thumb that you need an hour for, uh, a day for every hour, is that correct uh, to recover from, from jet lag? 
Uh, pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. So that's the, the from that. Anna, melatonin or Ambien? <laughs> Well, so I think there's a lot of bad publicity lately with all the hypnotics like Zolpidem, which is Ambien, and a lot of uh, the other similar ones. But they have played a very important role into helping people sleep uh, in a safer environment. Before the discovery of those agents, I think there was a bit of a crisis with the type of medications people were using that ended up leading to a lot of abuse and unnecessary health problems. So they have played a very important role. I think we just have evolved to know now that insomnia comes in different types. So understanding the phenotype of people is very important to understand what is the best management strategy for insomnia. Uh, the same way that some people have just a late sleep phase and they may present as insomniacs. So those would be great cases is that you can probably work with melatonin, increase the darkness at night, increase the light exposure in the morning, and try to shift their phases if they were going through a different time zone and impose that new rhythm. Um, melatonin is not as strong as many of the other sleeping pills, so it may not work for everybody. So I think that's where we are evolving into understanding where the field is going to go and what are the different abnormalities that people have so we can help them pharmacologically and non-pharmacologically as well, because we're very very clinically, it's very important for us to focus on all the other strategies that people can do to improve their sleep that don't really just relate in taking the magic pill at night and going to sleep. So as we see in so many other areas of med medicine, really tailoring the treatments with a combination of non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic treatments for the individual. Absolutely. Okay. And before we um, uh, open it up uh, to, to the audience, um, insomnia and depression uh, are often linked. Is that a strong link? Um, and uh, can you tell us about you know, some of the uh, uh, psychological effects of insomnia? Mm -hmm. So there is a big association between changes in mood and sleep. And if we look back, one of the first studies was done on many years, like 30 years follow-up from actually medical students when they described having poor sleep and then later on they were found to have depression and some other mood disturbances. Uh, so there is an association but the mechanism hasn't yet been fully determined because we know that many patients that have let's say severe depression, the patterns of sleep as we saw that initial diagram with the phases of sleep, it shows that an abnormality. They may have too much REM sleep, they may have REM sleep cycles that are kind of reversed, longer cycles earlier on in the night and, and shorter cycles as the night goes on. Uh, so we're still trying to understand what are all the mechanisms uh, that relate to this. Sometimes there are some interesting studies also showing that mood can be regulated by memory, so sometimes they just gather on a lot of more negative memories, so the mood may be a little more depressed during the day because of the sleep deficiencies at night. So I think it's a multifactorial aspect, but the jury is not out. I think the association has been demonstrated epidemiologically, but we haven't yet identified the true so mechanisms. So association, but causality could be in the other direction. Exactly. That depression affects sleep rather than sleep affecting depression, yeah, or, or both a combination <laughs> of both. Great. In, in someone that has a DSPD, um, how does time zone factor into it? If you're waking up at 4 in the morning in New York, why don't you just move to Hawaii and it's 10 and everything's great? Sort of how long would that be a temporary fix and how, how would that factor into getting you back on the wrong cycle? Right. So you can stay on the right cycle if you move half a time zone a day. So... Uh, but that's but that's really the the problem. It's not just it's not just uh, uh, it's not just moving to a different time zone and staying there. You have to keep moving, uh, and and that of course is impractical. Thank you for the excellent presentations. Uh, I have a, a question that I'm hoping you can help answer. This is a lifelong debate with my with my family and friends, which is if one is burning the candle at both ends for uh, three or four or five days. Can you make up the sleep by oversleeping for a day or two, say on the weekends, or and and if so, is that wise, or is it better just to get back onto a normal eight hour? So you can really never make up for the sleepy loss, the same way that I tell people that you can't ever eat for all the meals that you've lost, also and you skipped. So. It, 
the body would just have to just get realigned. Of course, there will be a bit of a catch up that needs to happen, and that happens usually over two or three days. But beyond that, there isn't a lot of catch up on the sleep. So you, that's the importance of maintaining the regular schedule and avoid the chronic sleep deprivation because that's what we're seeing a lot in society the five, six hour sleep land uh, that is happening during the five days of the week or sometimes even longer. Uh, hi, could you comment, um, if you're aware of it, but um, of a study, I'm afraid I can't remember the citation recently about hunter-gatherer societies needing very little sleep and so we don't either. And there was a lot of debate and the National Sleep Foundation seemed to be quite defensive about the matter. Um, it's, you know, it seemed to implicate, to imply that we don't need as much sleep as the scientific studies show? Um, I think that was actually very interesting. We just need to keep in mind that those isolated societies are intrinsically different than ours. Uh, and we have data from our society, not going back 500 years, but at least 50 years. Um, so in a lot of people that have different demands, different, different demand, physical demands, light exposure and routines and feeding and even the foods they eat. So that is very important to determine their sleep needs as well. Uh, also talking about biology of the isolated groups. So I wouldn't be very ready to bring in their data into our usual society and the patterns that we live in nowadays. I think they're very important by themselves as generating good data so it allows us to understand a little bit more about the true sleep needs. How do nightmares relate to um, <laughs> sleeping, <laughs> sleep deprivation and so forth? And thank you for this one. Uh, so nightmares, often they tend to be triggered during the rapid eye movement stage. So that's when a lot of, we call memory reallocation. There's a lot of transmission and some neurons have, are, they are building new bridges between them and creating new patterns of communication. Uh, and some of that content may kind of surface and intrude into a more awake type of state. So people may be conscious about what they were going through. Uh, sometimes we worry about nightmares or any strange behaviors that may happen and may start during adulthood because that may be a signal of a underlying sleep disorders that may be now fragmenting REM sleep. So you're forced to wake up during a natural dream period in the nightmare may be the the realization of this dream during wakefulness. Uh, in children, we're not too concerned because there are a lot of different behaviors that happen in relation to sleep that tend to go away as they get a little bit older through the teenage years or older. Can you comment, please, on the notion of the unconscious versus the conscious? In other words, oftentimes one says, if one is trying to do problem solving, go to sleep, think about, think about the problem, and the brain will take care of it naturally, and you'll wake up in the morning with a very interesting result. <laughs> So from the clinical side, um, a lot of things happen during a sleep and that's part of the, what the function of sleep we believe is. Uh, so it's truly necessary for cognitive function and there are many interesting studies showing that if you're posed with a problem before fall, falling asleep, uh, if you sleep through the night, your chances of resolving the problem or solving the issue are higher if you actually sleep than if you spend the whole night awake trying to solve it. Uh, so there is a lot of importance into the mechanisms of sleep. Um, so that's why I think it's very interesting because you don't want to now worry too much to the point that you can't sleep well. So that's that fine line into being posed the problem but allow yourself to sleep and sleep could help the process. Um, the other interesting aspect of that is with the challenge that you're faced at night. Um, when we look at the stages of sleep, as we saw earlier on, that stage one sleep, sometimes people are able to still do some processing uh, during that. We did a very interesting study, the same type of reaction time to that screen we, I mentioned earlier. And we saw that many subjects, when they were getting into stage one and even stage two, they kept on responding to the stimulus, while others as soon as they get into stage one, they are totally unconscious, let's say. Was so, it a visual stimulus or some other kind a of Visual stimulus? stimulus and the response was a, a finger tapping or removing the finger from a device, so really a true action. And so they saw the visual stimulus with their eyes closed? No, so they were in bed and we said, let's monitor you and see when, what, how long it will take for you to fall asleep. I see. In the meantime, do this test. So we could see the brain sleep-wake activity changing into stages one and two 
to and a few subjects still are able to respond. So there's still a lot that is unknown because we're talking about cellular process, but we are monitoring that with electrical activity. So we might not be monitoring exactly what is happening in the brain during the night. So this may be more of a marker of sleep. There, there, there are some very interesting studies that have been done in rats at MIT where uh, the rats train to run a maze. And, and what has been seen using FR, FMR, a, a imaging uh, a assessment of brain activity, particularly in certain cells uh, in our brains that are called place cells that, that light up when an animal is physically in a given position within the maze. What is seen is that the animal goes through a training session and then when it falls asleep, and they, and they follow the brain activity, these place cells light up as if the animal is still running the maze. So it might be that you know, when faced with a problem, we're doing something that's not spatially uh, represented in that way, but in some way is rerunning the issue over and over and over again, and we wake up having done a lot more work on it than we realize. That's right. <laughs> Um, I just have a question. We know that there's a lot of variability in people's responses to sleep loss, like reaction times and even weight gain. And we also know that we're not very good at knowing whether we're resilient to sleep loss or um, so, so people aren't a very good judge of perhaps what they really need. But do you know what might drive some of those differences in that some people do seem resilient and others seem very vulnerable? Any thoughts on that? I can, I can uh, pitch back to fruit flies again, uh, just for some ideas about how to, to study uh, things like that. We've, we've managed to isolate mutations that will uh, truncate the amount of sleep that the fly has every night. And these, these animals uh, sleep a third less every night than a, than a normal uh, Drosophila that they were derived from. And what you find is that they're very sensitive now to sleep, additional sleep deprivation. So this is a genetic change. This is an example of a genetic, genetic changes, a series of genetic changes that you can do that uh, affect what the animal senses as their normal um, duration uh, of sleep. Uh, but we now have a much more sensitive uh, system. And uh, so it, it could be that we have natural variation of that sort. And some of us are triggered by uh, 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 more sensitive to sleep uh, deprivation than others. A word that was often used tonight was word problems, sleep problems, and the onslaught of potential diseases or afflictions for the lack of sleep. And I, if I can personalize it, I was reflecting on myself when I was in university because of the faculty sleeping four hours a night, five days and six days a week, and at times, twice a month at least, stay, staying up for two or three days without sleep. And here I am, 60 years later, and I sleep three and a half or four hours a night. And is there a way to that people could extend that kind of um, cycle to avoid the onslaught of potential disease, I suppose. So this is very interesting because um, this kind of tags along a little bit with the previous question because there is a lot of individual variability and there are individuals that have lower sleep needs. So one concern that we have as a society is just to be careful because you do not want to establish some specific biotypes of people that perhaps adapt very well to sleep loss or can very sleep and do very well with just three or four hours of sleep at night to select them out. So this is something, is a very interesting concept, but we get to see a lot of very successful people that have a lot of sleep needs, but a lot more people that probably don't sleep as much. Um, so it could be more of your internal bias and how your body biologically is set up uh, to work. Um, I don't have a lot of science behind this next statement, but I believe that will be very hard for one person to, over a life course, just adapt oneself to sleep half of what the true sleep need for the body is without having any detrimental effect on either cognition or physiological function. Sleep discussions seem to usually relate to the visible light spectrum. Is there any work done on parts of the spectrum outside of visible light as triggers? So for circadian rhythmicity, uh, what are called action spectra have been produced in many different organisms to see what wavelength of light 
will reset these clocks. And so there are uh, uh, pretty precise measurements of those before anyone knew what the responding molecules were. Uh, but those, those kinds of experiments actually led us to things like cryptochrome and melanopsin as the, as the, uh, as the key mediators of the light responses. So far, there, there, have, been, there have been searches for other, other uh, uh, proteins, other molecules that would respond to other wavelengths of light, but those, uh, everybody's come up empty-handed uh, in those experiments. So you've got cryptochrome and you've got melanopsin uh, so far on the table and, uh, and no evidence for other, other uh, molecules. Should we not need to nap? Should we not need to nap? <laughs> I think it's a great way to end it. Um, yeah. Perhaps. Uh, I think in some cultures, people have that socially acceptable, and they might not need to sleep as much at night. So that is one way of offsetting a little bit of a sleep loss in one way. And some people that work with shift works, so let's say emergency room physicians often nap before a shift because they know that they don't have enough time to sleep on a regular schedule. Um, but I think it's an interesting proposal. I think, it's, again, it has individual susceptibility, so some people probably would do very well if they were to nap, and others will suffer through a siesta because they wouldn't be able to sleep. One of the things that triggers a siesta is a, a, a fluctuation in the body temperature rhythm. So uh, we don't go through just one cycle per day. We actually go through a dip in the temperature cycle and then a, a rise again. And so it looks like a camel's back. It's bicameral. There's a, it's perfectly reasonable to have a sleep need felt uh, uh, in the early afternoon. It's a response to that body temperature difference. And, uh, I don't think there's a lot known about what other physiological changes are triggered by that body temperature difference, but it, it, uh, it could easily set up the, uh, a natural uh, nap time in many cultures. Well, I think we've, we've learned a huge amount today. Thank you very much, Anna and Mike. <laughs>